I drove here in the rave playing AR app. I'm not sure what it was that really made y'all mad, but I guess this is what I gotta do to make y'all rap. I mean, oh, can't fool the city, man. They That's know that Drake. Up. That's that Drake meat meal then. A lot of folks are talking about this today. A lot of folks saying Drake was going in on this one, fam. Anyway, I'll talk about this later. That's that Drake Meek Mills thing. I'm going to get on that a little bit later. That's called Back to Back. But what's going on, family? How's everybody doing? Welcome back to the Tariq Elite Radio Show. I'm your gracious host. My name is Mr. Tariq Elite Nasheed, also known as King Flex, also known as Hot Poppy. To the ladies. And we're going to chop it up on today's show. So what I'm going to do, we're going to take a... Quick commercial break And when we get back from the commercial break We're going to get into some game, to some ism A lot of stuff we're going to talk about Particularly this Drake and Meek Mills diss Very briefly, because there's a lot of other stuff I want to get into And when I come back, like I said, after that, we're going to chop up some very good games. So y'all don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. As a community, we hardly see any programming portraying black couples. And when we do, we're bombarded with negative images of them. Through to Lives is a video blog documenting a young black couple's weekly journey in New York City. Viewers get to see all the fly things a young couple can do in the Big Apple, from cooking classes to yacht parties, the whole nine yards. Every week they post a new video blog and a new interactive quiz on their website throughtolives.com. So visit them at throughtolives.com. That's T H R U the number 2 L I V E S.com. And also check them out on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at through to lives. Do you or someone you know have difficulty writing a college research paper, a master thesis, or doctoral dissertation due to problems like uncertainty and confusion, lack of research information, procrastination, or writer's block? Then get the solutions fast. Solution Dissertation Coach has the right strategies and techniques for your writing project in all subject areas and research domains. Succeed now and graduate on time or before time. Contact the Solution Dissertation Coach at solutiondissertationcoach.us. That's solutiondissertationcoach.us. If you have a business or a brand, you need a professional website. And Black Line Web Design offers websites at a price that you can afford. For only $200, you can get a customized six page website with amazing features like a photo gallery options to include your logo and professional images google maps and so so much more grow your brand and increase your sales with this website visit them today and use the coupon code Tariq 20 to get twenty dollars off blacklinewebdesign.com that's blacklinewebdesign.com yo check out my man kevin gentry and his website become rich famous fast.com kevin has a one-on-one private school coaching website and he will teach you everything you need to know about the game and you can call him directly at 404-207-5640 call kevin up and he will teach you everything you need to know about being a true player and having real real tight game so check out become rich famous fast.com you are now tuning in to the king of game Tariq elite on Tariq elite radio What's up? We are back. We are back right here on the Tariq Elite Radio Show. I am Tariq Elite. Hey, man, don't forget, man, today's show is also sponsored by LegendaryMix.com. Are you a recording artist, music producer, independent label? Check out LegendaryMix.com if you need a professional mix down. Not that hollow, weak, watered down mix that y'all hear a lot of people with their demos put out they got the real fly mastering jobs going on they can really deliver they got 13 years of experience radio quality stuff man so go to legendarymix.com or call or text at 347-565-5892 or email them at legendarymix1 at gmail.com so we're back right here on the Tariq Elite Radio Show a lot of stuff I want to talk about I was talking earlier about the Drake Meek Mill diss. And a lot of people, it's the it's, it's hot right now. Hip-hop beef, you know, we haven't had a real good hip-hop beef in a while. And as long as it stays on wax, that's cool in the game. But we haven't had a real good hip-hop beef in a while. Now, Drake put out one, one cut a few days ago. It was so-so. And people were like, eh. But he put out the new one, the back-to-back joint. And people were like, uh-oh. 
So people are sitting back watching Meek Mill seeing how he's going to respond. Now, now, Meek, if Meek responds, he has to come with heat. The stakes are high for Meek Mill's response. And I hope everything works out in, in Meek and Nikki's relationship. I, I'm not trying to turn this into a gossip show. But my man, it's a, it, it almost sounds like my man then got pussy whooped a little bit. My man is going crazy. Meek just starts spazzing out on everybody. You know, when a nigga gets some, some good cooch, niggas don't know how to act. I ain't saying that's how Meek Mill is getting down. But goddamn, Meek is just going at everybody's neck. And I like Meek Mill. Meek, yeah, I was in Philly. Philly showed me so much love when I did my lecture out there a few weeks ago. They were bumping his stuff. Man, Meek has some hot shit. So everybody's waiting to see how Meek is going to represent. And Meek was going in on everybody. He was in Safari. That's Nikki's ex. And that's another thing. What Nikki's ex do, and I know it's hard to see your chick, your ex chick, all publicly cupcaking with her new dude. Because y'all remember when Nikki was in the relationship with Safari for a long time, she really didn't, you know, bring this dude out publicly on some holding hands, kicking cans tip. She kind of kept him in the background and made it seem like, okay, you know, I got a dude, but he's in the background. She, she wasn't doing all this old cupcaking with him. So she, you know, they dump each other. She dumps him or whatever, but she got the new dude and they're just cupcaking all over the place, kicking, kissing, licking. And they got music videos together. She's brushing his hair and they washing each other's feet. And, you know, it's hard breaking up as it is. But when you break up with somebody and you see your lady and her ex everywhere, I know my man Safari has to be feeling that a little bit. Now, Safari, the, the ex, he's a rapper. And, and bless his heart. Bless Safari's heart. He's trying to get it in. But my man Safari, he keeps catching... L's everywhere he goes. There was one video of him getting run off the block. He was up there in, I think, somewhere in Brooklyn, and some some goons ran him off the block. Then he had to go get some random goons to come back. It was it was a bad look. But my man got him a new chick, and and, and, and shout out to Safari. And and Meek Mills on one of Meek Mills' Twitter disses, he was dissing Drake and just a whole bunch of people. He dissed Safari. He was talking about a twerk video that Safari had out. It was a video of this brother, Nikki's ex, Safari, twerking. And then the video came out. And, and my man was kind of busting it open a little bit. It, it wasn't a good look. Again, my man Safari is just taking L's. I don't know why my man was twerking. You know, my man bent over and busted open a little bit. He damn near got down and got his eagle on. I said, what's going on with the brother? He's, he's popping his ass like a cheerleader. So Safari, I, I, hey, he might have been young. I don't know how old the video is. <laughs> Maybe there was a reason he was popping it like a cheerleader. You know, I try to play the devil's advocate. I'm not just going to try to. <laughs> but Meek Mill went on the dude, went in on the dude, man. But hey, Safari's a cool dude. I like Safari. Safari, if you're listening, I'm not dissing you, Safari. But I got this song. It's for you. Let me dedicate this to Safari. Like no this, really this is for go. Safari. Cheerleader. Cheerleader. That's what's the fire right there. Right there I need her. Oh, I think that I found that's Nikki's a ex. A cheerleader. Because that's how right he was twerking. All right, anyway, I digress. Anyway, let me stop messing with folks. I'm going to put my Mac and music back on. But hey, it is what it is. I digress. Now, a lot of other stuff is going on, family. Out here in LA, let me, let me address something that's a rumor that's happening out here. A lot of people are talking about a hashtag called 100 Days, 100 Nights about some L.A. gangs that's planning on a murder spree. They're planning on doing a murder spree where they kill 100 people in 100 days. So that hashtag has been promoted by the white supremacists very heavy. And apparently there's some people who have bought into this crock of 100% bullshit. That hashtag and this whole thing where some some guys from the neighborhood crips and, and the, the 100 block and the Hoovers and all, they, it's not no 100 killing spree bull. It's, not, it's total bullshit. It's total bullshit. What happened? 
there was a, a shooting of an OG dude, a brother named KP from um, Original Block. R.I.P. to that brother. He's Crip. And I think they blamed the Hoovers and then there was some retaliation and there's a lot of retaliation going back and forth. Then all of a sudden, this mysterious hashtag popped out talking about these gangs made a bet on who can shoot 100 people first. Now, yes, there's violence. There's some violence going on. There's an upsurge, temporary upsurge of violence. But it has nothing to do with no bet that two gangs made. I think that whole hashtag slash 100 days, 100 nights bet that these gangs allegedly made, I think that's the white supremacists at work as usual. This is nothing but another version of the knockout game where they create some fake collaborative beef or some collaborative attack on the public, assign it to black folks and then start targeting black folks with certain laws. Y'all remember with that whole knockout game thing, which was a total fake, they got a whole bunch of unrelated videos and said there's this whole game that uh, all these black people are playing. So then they started to try to enact, and I think they did enact special laws for assault based on the knockout game propaganda. And this is the same thing. They're going to try to just reinforce some more gang injunctions out here because let me tell y'all something. First of all, these L.A. niggas, what y'all have to understand for those who people who are not from L.A. And there's a lot of people who are trolling, pretending they were from South Central and all this stuff. And I was hitting them up and they were hitting me up kind of trolling. And I was asking them very specific questions that they couldn't Google and none of them could could answer the questions. So that led me to believe that there were a lot of these Cointel Pro type fake pages instigating this fake hashtag that's being promoted especially by the right wing white supremacists but let me explain about some of these LA cats LA dudes number one if they gonna get at somebody they don't get on no fucking twitter and make hashtags niggas ain't that dumb they do not get on twitter and make hashtags about what they're gonna do LA dudes don't roll like that for those who don't know they do not, and they don't even warn people about when they're gonna get at them. That's that's another thing. They don't be sitting up making threats and talking. About, oh, I'm gonna get you on July 18th. I'm getting you. They don't. L.A. That's not how L.A. dudes do. These niggas run up on you when you slipping. It's the surprise attack. That's the style out here. The dudes out here catch you slipping when you least expect it. That's their mo. All that, I'm sending a hashtag to come get you. That ain't even the L.A. dude style, dude. Come on. Y'all stop buying into that cornball bullshit that these feds are low-key propagating on on Facebook and Instagram. These dudes ain't about to tweet nobody when they gonna get them and I'm gonna get y'all in 100 days and fuck out of here, man. If you know when them dudes are coming to get you, it's too late. They done got you. But that's a fake. It's fake. Ain't no hundred people getting killed and all that. There's there's some retaliation for that little that gang thing. There's a couple of people beefing and all that, but it ain't no big whole gang thing. Because if it were, let's use common sense. They have some of the strictest gang injunctions out here. They get folks for wearing sir. If you walk in a certain neighborhood wearing the wrong color, the cops can swoop you up and say, "Okay, you got gang paraphernalia. We're gonna charge you for having gang symbolisms on." If they see a certain tattoo on on somebody, they'll tie you into a gang and just arrest you for just being affiliated with a gang. So do you think people out here with hashtags killing people and putting the hashtag out here and you know which gangs are doing it or allegedly doing it? You don't think that they would swoop down on the gang immediately? They would have swooped down on Hoover's neighborhood, 100 block. They would have swooped down on them on day one. If they were really out here killing people, just use common goddamn sense. The cops would have swooped down on all of them. So that's a farce, man. You got to understand this whole thing about 
gang initiations, this whole thing where these reports come out talking about how gangs of, 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 of black folks, especially L.A. gangs, are going to kill random innocent people as some type of initiation. Those stories have been going on since the 70s. Really before that, the whole black mob violence thing, that's been going on since the 19, the 1800s, really. Stories about black mob violence, but about gangs in particular, these stories about if you leave a gang, they'll kill you. That's that white supremacist bullshit. They, they, they've always had these, these lies and propaganda machines about street gangs in L.A., and it's always every couple of years there's always some type of initiation where the public is in danger of the gangs y'all remember google this a couple of years ago they had another version of the 100 days 100 nights propaganda where it was a, supposed to be a bunch of bloods this time see they switched the gangs up and i can even go further than that well in, in baltimore they were talking about the bloods and crips are getting together to attack the police and they found out that was a complete lie. Then a couple of years ago, y'all remember, they said the Bloods were going to start killing innocent civilians if they flashed their lights. The Bloods were supposed to be driving around with their lights off. And if somebody flashed their lights, the Bloods were supposed to kill them. That was a rumor and a lie that's been propagated for years. So they have different versions of the mob violence gang initiation gang bet public threat there's always a different version of it and that goes back again with la gangs to the 70s in the 70s they were doing that there's a movie that you guys should check out that had a version of that whole la gang attack civilian propaganda there was a movie in 1976 and i think you guys can watch it on um YouTube is called Assault on Precinct 13. Now, they made a remix of the movie in, uh, I think, 2005. I think Ja Rule, somebody was in it. And I think they filmed it in Detroit. But the original version was filmed in South Central Los Angeles. It was like in a, I think, in a make-believe neighborhood called Anderson. But it was really, it was in South Central Los Angeles. And I think you guys can see the whole movie on YouTube. Very good movie. It was made by John Carpenter, who made Halloween and all that. And the movie was about a street gang in L.A. that made a blood oath. That sound familiar? To start killing civilians. So they went around the neighborhood and they saw a couple of white people. They shot like a white girl, a little white girl, and shot a, a, another white guy. So they were shooting innocent people, and then the police were after them, and then they were after the police, and then they held a precinct hostage, and they were attacking the police. So go check that movie out. That movie had all the elements that they still use to this day that the gangs are going to attack innocent white people. That's what they really want to say. It's innocent white people that's going to be in danger and they are going to attack the police. And again, it's all propaganda because what happens is that they keep putting that lie out. And then what happens is that the cops use that to swoop down on random innocent black people who have nothing to do with no hashtag or gang because they're really trying to further gentrify South Central Los Angeles. They're, they're already gentrifying it as it is, so they need to find more ways to just rid those areas of black folks completely. That's why if you go to places like the um, Fox Hills Mall, or what used to be the Fox Hills Mall, I think they call it something else, the Westfield Shopping Center, they call it something else. That shit looks like the Beverly Center now. So they're getting black folks up out of South Central. It's sending black folks out to Lancaster, Riverside, all those places, and jail. So gentrification is real and it is in effect and we got to stop going for the propaganda family. And we also got to stop letting these white supremacists throw out misinformation and we bite it. Because a lot of times these white supremacists, they throw out misinformation and because black folks want to be seen, black folks want to get camera time, black folks will start going along with it just to get on camera. And that shit is corny. 
And also like with the Sandra Bland situation Our sister who was found mysteriously um, murdered Allegedly down in a, a Texas jail There were a lot of stories coming out on the internet Talking about where she she might have been dead in her mugshot photo and what we got to stop biting on all of those stories that come out because the white supremacists they deliberately put out misinformation and then when we jump on it they discredit that after they put it out and then they try to invalidate all of our arguments so we got to be very careful about all these groups like these so-called anonymous groups who come out and say hey we got information where she was already dead and they putting up pictures that are obviously photoshopped and we got to be very careful about people putting out misinformation. Question everything, fam. And a shout out to the city of Cincinnati. There was a brother, Sam DuBose. He got killed, murdered in cold blood by a cop out there. Well, not a cop. It was a race soldier. And... The race soldier cop tried to lie and said that brother Sam drug him in the car and he had to shoot him for his safety. And when the video came out, that didn't happen at all. The video came out today and everybody in Cincinnati was on alert because they thought there were there would be riots when the video came out if there wasn't an indictment. So when the video came out, the prosecutors immediately made an indictment of the officer, the one officer. Now, they should have indicted both officers because there were two officers one officer was the one who lied and there was another second officer who lied for him as well who backed up the first lie so all of those officers should be indicted including the chief of police who saw the video way before everybody else because they did not want to release the video they weren't going to release the video the video was the the body cam of the police officer and that's another thing man with these cops having body cams if they got this thing where they can hold on to the cam footage and not release it what good is it so we got to make make these body cam videos available to the public and not have to jump through red tape because i think the family had to go through a lot of red tape to get that video and now that the video was seen they had to get a tactical alert and make sure that schools were shut down so that there wouldn't be any rioting because Cincinnati is known for turning up they turn the hell up in Cincinnati they get it popping in Cincinnati and they knew some shit was going to go down if they didn't indict that dude because they don't give a fuck in Cincinnati so we're going to see what happens with this but again we're dealing with these race soldiers who are getting very bold out here because we live in a system of white supremacy and I always reiterate that and you're going to hear me reiterate that in this conversation I have with this young lady, her name is Kim Classic. Now, take this this conversation. I wouldn't even call it a debate. Usually, I call certain things like this like this a debate, but this isn't a debate. I, I call this a conversation because really, this young lady was learning from what I was saying. Now, me and this young lady, we were kind of going back and forth on Twitter a couple of days ago, talking about white supremacy, and she was somewhat defending white supremacy she was kind of making excuses uh, for white supremacy because we're talking about certain things that's happening with these shootings and everything and i thought i said wait a minute this sister's kind of defending white supremacy a little bit too much so i researched a little bit i said i hope there's not a little negro bedwinch thing going on and you know i researched her found out she had a white husband so i wasn't shocked so I invited her to come on the show and the the conversation we had is very respectful. We have a very respectful conversation. This is a very long conversation. So you guys just sit back and get some popcorn and just chill. But it's interesting to just get into the mindset of a person who could be suspected to be a Negro bed wench. And I'm not saying she is or she isn't because I'm very respectful to my guests. I don't want to call my guests names. But some people, a lot of people who were following me and looking at the interaction between me and her, a lot of people suspected her of being a Negro bedwench. But she was very respectful in the conversation and seems like a lot of stuff she was soaking in. Seems like she was soaking in the game and she was having little revelations. 
And again, she calls herself a black conservative. And I think it's very interesting for us to really, instead of being antagonistic all the time, we need to understand the mindset. And I want you to understand the mindset of how certain people who are black conservatives and possible NBWs, how they think. So sit back and listen to this conversation with me and Kim Classic, also known as the Black Female Conservative. Hello. Hello, is this Tariq? This is Tariq. Is this Kim? Is your last name Classic? Is it? How do I pronounce your last name? It is Classic. Ukrainian. Classic. Classic. Yep. Kim Classic. So how are you, Kim? I'm doing good. How are you? I am good. I'm good. Now, Kim, you are, uh, you would consider yourself a black conservative. Is that, that correct? Yeah, somewhat. I consider myself socially liberal and fiscally conservative. Yes, oh, okay. And um, you have a, I'm just trying to give people a little background information about you. You, you, run a non, okay. you run a nonprofit organization. What's the name of your nonprofit, by the way? It's Potential Me. Potential me. Okay, we'll get into that yeah. a little bit later. Now, you and I, we, we were corresponding with each other on Twitter because mm -hmm. um, you were, um, I felt that you were somehow defending or um, kind of deflecting away from white supremacy. And you, okay. you seem to be making a lot of excuses for white supremacy. And I think we were talking about the Sandra Bland situation, right? Correct. Yes, it was. Now, what's your what's your thoughts on the Sandra Bland situation? You as a as a now you consider yourself black, right? Oh yes. Okay, I have to ask because I know conservatives. I've been on Jesse Lee Peterson's show, and he told me he was not black. He's an American. So I, I need to, <laughs> I just need to know what you what what you consider yourself. I don't want to be offensive by calling you black. So. <laughs> no, I'm black. I'm definitely black. So, what's your thoughts on uh, the Sandra Bland situation? See, and this is where I think, you know, on Twitter, you only get so many characters and you only see the surface sometimes of what someone's saying. But I think we kind of agree on that situation. I think there was some wrongdoing on the police. Obviously, there was a lot of wrongdoing. I don't even know why she was arrested to begin with. Right. And for someone to have no priors, I, well, I don't understand why she was even in an orange jumpsuit right. um, for a traffic violation at all. It didn't make any sense. Right. Um, obviously, something happened there. There was some foul play, and, you know, I hope to get to the bottom of it. I think when we were going back and forth, uh, we were kind of talking about, you know, whether or not the name was coming out, and this was in the Lafayette shooting, the movie here. Oh, okay. And we did talk a little bit about Sandra Bland, but it started with the Lafayette shooting. So what were we and saying? What, what were we saying about the Lafayette shooting? Let's refresh me. Yeah, that. yeah, I know. It was a few days ago. Um, so we were talking about how the name didn't come out immediately. Um, and maybe you were saying because he was white. You know, that whole lone white shooter that they like to say, which is wrong. I agree with that totally. Right. If they lone white shooter was a white person and a black person, you know, they say murder suspect. So, you know, I understand that. And I agree with that. That's wrong. Um, but I do think that they don't have the resources um, in some cities, especially maybe in that Lafayette area, where they had a bunch of corners and investigators on the scene. And this guy, it kind of seemed like he was kind of a loner to himself a little bit. And I don't think they kind of, it's almost like they didn't really know who he was. So I think what happened was they didn't want to say, oh, well, this is so-and-so ended up being the John Hauser guy. You see what I'm saying? But the thing is, they knew, they knew who he was after they, you know, they identified him, but they just they just didn't want to release the name of the guy. And the, yeah. the same thing happened okay. the, in the Studio City the next day out here in Los Angeles. There was a guy, a white guy, who shot up in the air, and he scared a lot of people. The cops came and shot the guy, and I don't even think they released that guy's name yet. So my thing was that mm -hmm. we live in a system of white supremacy where the media is complicit in that system of white supremacy, and they go out of their way to protect other suspected white supremacists. Do you agree or disagree with that? To, to a certain extent, I think that does happen in some cases. But I do think, personally, I do think in that particular case, I don't think the media was holding out. I really do think that every media outlet was trying to break that story first. But the thing is, you have to understand, when 
there's a phone call sent to the media to black out something, they will follow orders. But I was out in Ferguson when everything really went down out there for the first time. And at first, there mm-hmm. was no media out there, and they didn't show a lot of stuff that happened in Ferguson the first day or the first couple of mm-hmm. days. So there was a major media blackout. The only information we got was online. And that brought international press, and then the, uh, the, the national press here got on Ferguson a few days later when the uprisings happened. So the media, they're complicit when they, they have orders. Um, when the people on top tell them to black something out, they'll black it out. When they tell them not to say something, they won't say it. So they, they know how to follow orders. And that was my whole point, is that we, we live in a system of white supremacy, and you have all of these entities that are compliant with each other. Okay, well, I, you know, and then for that particular case, I think we'll have to disagree to disagree, because I don't think that, obviously, Ferguson was handled all wrong. I mean, look, I live in Baltimore City. Right. I mean, obviously, they don't know how to handle a ton of things. But for me, with that Lafayette shooting, I really do believe they did not have the resources to get it out immediately. Mm. And that's why I brought up the Navy Yard case, and I was living outside of D.C. when that happened. Um, They really didn't know who Aaron Alexis was for a little while. I know you said they released it later that night. But it took later that night to release it. Uh, when that shooting happened, it was 12:20 in the afternoon, and like you said, they released it around nine o'clock that night, I believe. Yeah, um, well, that's yeah. how long it took. Well, yeah, they. I think they released it because I saw a website that had all the updates on the shooting in D.C. And mm-hmm. the minute they got the guy's name or, or the minute they identified who he was, because he was basically just a dead, uh, a, a random black guy to them. But when they identified who he was, they immediately put his name and his photograph out there in the media, because I remember that specifically. But with a lot of white suspects, they will protect them. They won't often put their faces out there like that. And one thing, they will always use the lone wolf angle, but with a black suspect who commit some type of murder, they will make a point to make all or as many black people as possible complicit with that killing. Just like the situation when the man shot the two cops up there in New York, this guy, I think he was from Baltimore, as a matter of fact, or Philly. Yeah, of, he, right. He's from yep. Baltimore, right. From Baltimore. Yeah, that guy, they immediately put his face and name out there. Not only that, they start talking about there's a gang called the Black Gorilla Family that's behind it. Then they were talking about the Black Panthers. They started naming every black organization imaginable, trying to make them responsible for that shooting. And also these media outlets started to line up all these black celebrities to make them apologize for that shooting and repudiate that guy. And they, they don't do that with us. They don't go and get a whole bunch of white people and say, Hey, um, we apologize for Dylan roof. They don't do that at all. So I, it's, it's just a double standard because we live in a system of white supremacy. Do you agree or disagree with that, ma'am? Not in every single case. I don't I don't agree with every single case. In a lot of cases, I do. A lot of cases, I mean, you have to understand it. So you, once a week, I go down to the Capitol, and I help down there, and I, I write for politics, and so I do interviews with congressmen and things like that. Please know, I am probably one of the only black women that you will see down there. Of course. Okay? There's not a lot of black people at all, right? Mm-hmm. It's almost like to the point where we almost kind of defeat ourselves in a way, and I'm not saying everybody, but I almost feel like we don't have the confidence to step up and to become, you know, that hierarchy, like to become part of the team and say, look, I'm going to go ahead and run from Congress. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say what's going on, and I'm going to have a say. You know what I mean? I feel like, and I know we went back and forth, and you don't like to say Democrat or Republican. Is that correct? Right, because they're all controlled by the white supremacists, and I want to talk to you about that too, but go ahead with your point, sister. All right, so to me, the way this whole system is set up, and this is what I deal with with my nonprofit in Baltimore City, I have people that literally tell me, and I help, and I go out, and I try to help women find jobs, not just jobs, but careers, where they can climb the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. But they'd rather accept welfare checks and live on the system because that's the easy way to go. Meanwhile, they stay, they're stagnant because you only get as far as that government assistance lets you get. And so then everybody, people are okay with that. They're mm. like, you know, oh, well, I get food stamps. Oh, I got this. I got that. You know what I mean? Right. It's right. like nobody wants to do the work. Nobody wants to step up to the plate. Mm. 
Well, and, and I, I agree to a certain extent because I get on a lot of people for taking government assistance like welfare because my thing is if they're going to mm-hmm. get in, if we're going to get anything from the government, give us reparations. I don't want welfare and food stamps, everything that the other poor, broke white people are getting. Give us something that's unique mm-hmm. to us because we deserve reparations in this country because we built it and we still live in a system of slavery, which is white supremacy. But welfare has been a, a trap. Section 8 and all that, that's been somewhat of a trap to keep us stagnant and plantation in mind right. but right. one talking point i noticed from people who call themselves uh, republicans and, and especially black republicans they never talk mm-hmm. about why there are black people on welfare i hear the whole family value argument do you subscribe to that argument well you know what it's like it's hard for me to say because i grew up in a home where both my parents are there both my parents worked hard so for me to say oh, well, this person's not doing well because they didn't have a father. Who am I to say that? I didn't live that life. Right. So I can't speak on that. Okay. So the thing is, let's, let's peel the layers back because there are, you know, you got a lot of black people who are on welfare and Section 8 and all that, but we have to look at why they are on that. Why would a dispro- disproportionate amount of black people need government assistance? Why would they need that? I can't tell you. I, I wrote an article about this maybe two months ago um, in the rural area. This is something that, like you would say, the media doesn't expose. 63% of white Americans are on government assistance, where it's really less. I think it was like 50% of black Americans. So it's actually more white people on government assistance, of course. Um, and yeah. that is because they're in the rural areas and things like that. Oh, yeah. So I don't know why. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, and that's another thing. A lot of times, people, especially so-called conservatives, but but liberals do this too. They will use mm-hmm. these talking points about so many blacks on welfare, so many blacks are doing this, so many blacks are doing that, and they throw out all of these talking points without one talking about the reason and two talking about the solution, and basically that's mm-hmm. the way for them to sell their product over and over again. You know what I'm saying? Just basically Mm -hmm. scaring the general white population, because that's what that's about. That's about scaring the white population about the black boogie men and black boogie women. These Mm -hmm. demonic, evil black people are coming to get you their own welfare food stamps. They're playing the knockout game. We don't know why they're doing it. We don't know how to stop them, but buy my next book or tune into the next Fox episode. So. Yeah, well, I think it's ignorance on both sides because you have a lot of ignorant people on the white side, I think it's just like you said, black people getting all this assistance. When that's not the case, it's more white. Right. Um, so it's just like there's a lot of ignorance, and unfortunately, when people go to the polls and they vote or they, you know, say things online, it's like sometimes it's out of ignorance. You know, it's like they need to do the research and they do it. And I actually, believe it or not, I actually respect what you say most of the time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because you do, you do fact check. Mm-hmm. And, and you do know your history, and I I, I respect that. Yes, indeed. Uh, but, you know, there's times where I disagree. Like, for me, I don't like the name Holland. You know, I'm not a coon. I'm definitely not a coon or a bed wench. <laughs> um, my husband <laughs> is white. And, yeah. if, you know, if you were to ask me for a picture, because I hate that picture that you posted. That is, I don't even have it in my yeah, house. Yeah, when I, when I was talking to you and you started giving me some of those answers, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, oh, I'm getting a little bedwinch spirit here. I said, oh, let me look her up. And sure yeah, but, enough, see, but that, there was a white I'm husband. Not, I'm not a bedwinch, though. You know, I've had these talking points and I've had these views. I've only been married to my husband for two and a half years. And I felt this way for over 10 years. And this is growing up. You know, I, I grew up in Akakeek Mill and moved to Baltimore. You know, I lived somewhere in the city. And I just could kind of see what was going on. You know, I've always worked hard. My parents worked hard. But why do you think and, it? You know, but, 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 and I knew, I knew you had a white husband just by the way that you were defending the white supremacists. Why do you think so many black women who marry white guys or have white mates, why do they always seem to have this defense mechanism for white supremacy? But this is where, we're, where, we're, where you're wrong. I I would have had the same the same thing to say to you prior to finding my husband. Mm. That's where we're wrong. I've I've, I've always had this it's feeling. Like, and then, you know, both my parents, like I said, are black. 
as you know, and, and, and also also the, the black conservative women. Almost every black conservative female I know has a white significant other, and I, I don't believe in coincidences. That's a pattern. Why do you think that pattern is? I don't know why it's for some other people. Um, I, I I know about my relationship. I can't speak on you know other people's behalf. I I just know my relationship and you know how I grew up, things like that. Now, have you ever dated a black man before? Yes. Okay. Yes. How long ago? Uh, I was in high school, oh, actually, okay. more than one black guy. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. And yeah. the thing I is, just don't discriminate, Tariq. I mean, what, how is that so hard to, to take? No, in? there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. I, I, ain't nothing wrong with interracial okay. dating. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But the problem is, okay. the problem is when black people start interracial, interracially dating, we start taking mm -hmm. on the mindset of the white supremacists. And a lot of black so, women who my marry. Question. Go ahead. Okay. My question to you is, then why don't they take on our mindset, right? Is it not a 50-50 relationship? And that's the thing. Why is that worth taking on there? And that's, and that's the, I always talk about that. See, the white supremacists, they know not to be confused sexually. When they get with black people, <laughs> they know not to be confused. We get confused sexually when we get with people in the dominant society, and that's a problem because they can have sex with us and get up and get back and start running the plantation again because they've had a history of having sexual relationships with us and keeping that in a sexual realm they'll even wipe you up there were slave owners who wiped up their their slave mistresses in several instances especially down in florida it was a major case in the 1800s of a black slave mistress who was married to a spanish slave owner he died and the family fought vehemently to get the resources back from the plantation and and, and the money from this sister but the point is the mm -hmm. a lot of the sisters have that plantation mistress mentality when they date a white male and they start talking about their black conservatives and i always want to know what's your conserving what what as a black person what exactly are you conserving in my opinion yes yes more so fiscally you know physically I think spending is out of control spending is out of control spending I mean, <laughs> spending in America, spending is out of control. There is so much money going into assistance, and like I said, it's not just black people. That's what people but are they, wrong. they're not spending it on white people. But Kim, they're not spending it on you. They ain't spending it on me. All this spending, it ain't going no, to black folks. I'm, I'm, I'm paying taxes. I'm running a small business, paying taxes, which is double what I pay my employees. I mean, that it's crazy. And hell, and the taxes, and I pay taxes too, and the taxes we pay, right. it don't really cover us because we pay for police officers who abuse us. So the money that we're spending in taxes, it's not even being used for us. It's it's paying for prosecutors who will let black children get killed in the streets. It's paying for DAs who will turn their backs when they see a Eric Garner or somebody get choked out. So our money is not, our tax money is not being utilized on us. So what are, what exactly are we conserving? So where do you think our tax money is going to be? Um, it, it goes to keep the white supremacists in power. That's why I think that black people in America should be tax ex exempt. Not only should we be tax exempt like Native Americans, because we are a sovereign. We should be sovereign because we are a marginalized group in this country. Just because one or two of us are let into the um, realms of certain parts of the dominant society, that does not equate to um, progress for the masses of us. And that's the problem. See, we get fooled by one or two black people being allowed in to certain areas. But I always look at how black people are treated as a group. Yeah, that makes sense? Yes. Do you ever look at how black people treat other black people? Absolutely. And that's all orchestrated by the white supremacists. All of it. It's definitely not. It's definitely why, not. Uh, it's why definitely not? not. Why not? Dear? You know, it's. Like, okay, for instance, how you call people coons and bedwinches. That you are not, you clearly are not affected by white supremacy, correct? Uh, who, but me? But you still do that. Am I, who, am I affected by white supremacy? You clearly are not. Yeah, yes, I am. I'm affected by white supremacy because I live in a system of white supremacy that create coons and bedwinches. That's a creation so of white supremacy. that's why you call people that? That's why you say that to other blacks? Well, the thing is, the term isn't negative. The action is negative, which makes the term negative. So if I made up a word and called them fuzzy wuzzies, 
The word Fuzzy Wuzzy will be negative after a certain while because of their actions. So it's the actions that's making the word so-called negative. You understand? But my actions, my actions aren't negative. What I do on a daily basis, it is a negative. You and, can call it cooning or coon or bedwenching or whatever you want. And by the I'm way, and by the way, Kim, and, and by the way, Kim, the bedwench, that's what the white supremacists used to call their bed, their, their slave mistresses when they had sex with them. That's what they would call that's, them when you look at the. That's great. That's, that, that's great what they call that. But I'm talking to you about black people hurting other blacks. So I'm asking you mm -hmm. why, then why continue that hurting, and but, say Betty but black, and Tumi? But black people, for the most part, don't hurt other blacks. They always overemphasize so called black on black crime as if that's some type of unique phenomenon. In, intra racial crime is normal. Whites commit crime at the same rate that blacks commit crime against each other in every other group. But they overemphasize so called black on black crime as if that's an unusual phenomenon. And if we look at crime stats today, if we're going to be honest, black crime between black people, especially violent crime, is at an all time low, except in Chicago. And with Chicago, there's so many unanswered questions as far as the violence that go on there. But and don't forget Baltimore City. Don't yeah, forget Baltimore but, City. Well, that, the crime rate got a little higher recently in Baltimore City, and that's because I think some of the, the white supremacist law enforcement people are behind that. Whenever you have these unions that are being targeted by um, politicians, they lash out and do things on the low, just like they did in New York in the 80s when they started filing charges and breaking up some of the police unions. It's a documented fact that, off-duty police officers would go around vandalizing certain parts of the city and and reacting negatively. So I, I don't. Yeah, put any... and I don't. I don't discount that that ever happened. But I will say in Baltimore City, a lot of our problems stem from the mayor and who she has around her. That's I... a lot of our problem, and then that's being like you say, white well, supremacy there because she loves that money, mm -hmm. and she barks when they tell her to bark, and so unfortunately that trickles down. Baltimore City and the rest of the neighborhood. Absolutely. And it is affecting the black community, and she is a black leader affecting us in the worst way. But she is a, a so called black leader who's orchestrated by white money. So I'm looking at the white supremacists who's funding her and pulling her chain, and those white police unions that's pulling the chain too. So we always got to go back to the white supremacists because black people, we're subjects of white supremacists out here in this country. We don't run or own or control anything. And as soon as we be honest about that, we can start solving problems. Do, do you agree? Well, I can make that? probably a, a very good list of the black people making money off of the black crime and the things that are happening in Baltimore City right now. Uh, who makes it? How, how do black people? Now, how, now, how, how, do, how do black people? Now, how do black people make money off black crime? How do black people make money off black crime? The same way you said just now. Like you said, there were times where the police were going up, right? Mm -hmm. Drumming up a little craziness, right? So that other people can get paid. We have a lot of corrupt cops, a lot of them. So now at this point, I don't know if you know this, but in top October, the Freddie Gray case, that's when it's going to all come down. We're only going to go in two directions, all right? Either people are going to get convicted, those cops are going to get convicted, and everything's going to be hunky-dory, yay, we won, we won, we won. But then the cops, they're going to lay down, right? Mm. And the black gorillas, gang, the, all those gangs, they do exist. They do exist. There is, but you know, there are people I, out there. They, that they, they're powerless. They, those gangs are powerless. I was out there. I was, those gangs. No, they Kim, they Kim. run our city, Tariq. Kim, did did I you was, not see the where they run? They were running the prison. They're, they're, they're not, not like they no stop prison. running the prison. They ain't running they're, no they're prison. Not covering it right they're now. not running a prison, sister. I, I was, the first I was out there in Baltimore. I had a town hall meeting out there. I, I met up with the Crips, Blood, some of the BGFs. I know a lot of those cats, and I'm from LA. I know all the OGs and all that stuff. And and I know some of them too because of what the work I do. Well, go ahead. Yes, indeed. But those guys were out there. From what I seen, number one, they were the Crips and Bloods were protecting a lot of the black businesses out there. They weren't trying to target the cops. And as a matter of fact, that whole lie that the media put out that the Crips and Bloods and all these people are coming together to target the cops, right. they got in That's trouble out there. They got in trouble for saying that because the the feds went in there looking for ev evidence of this, and they couldn't provide evidence. So they concluded right, that, that was it, a complete lie. 
it was, was a com- complete lie. Exactly. So all this stuff, whenever they talk, start talking about the Crips and the Bloods and all the black gang members, I always take it with a grain of salt because I know that the white supremacists are uh, perpetual liars. So I always go back to them. So when we, talk- I know for a fact that people in charge, especially police, the chiefs, they are afraid of the black gorilla family. I know I, that for I, a fact. I promise you, they're not. I would be too. They're not. They're not afraid of us. They're not. How, how are they afraid of us? And they, uh, sister, I was in Baltimore. Those people had tanks and rocket launchers. It looked like Iraq. If you have all of that weaponry, you who are you? Re- I live here. You got to respect that, Tariq. I live here. I have my office is six blocks from North Ave and Pennsylvania Ave, where all that went down. I live here, so I know exactly. You got to respect that, right? And these, but but when they talk, the law enforcement talk about they're afraid of some little gang members of these little black unarmed teenagers throwing rocks at tanks. They're not afraid of no, them. No, they're not. They're not afraid of them. They're afraid of the real guys. That no one would see in the media. They wouldn't come out in the media and be like, "Oh, hey guys, we're here to protect." And hey, what's up, media? No, they're not going to be out there. They they pretend you know what I mean? I, all that stuff about them being afraid of black gang members. They control all of them. They're not afraid of them one bit. They use that I'm afraid for my life thing in order to justify killing us. For example, when we, the Walter Scott situation, we, we saw the, the video of Walter Scott getting shot out there in South Carolina. Um, the cop used that before the video was available. He used that whole I was afraid for my life pitch. But when you see the video of him shooting Walter Scott in the back, this cop was so mm-hmm. calm. He was so relaxed. He calmly shot him and calmly looked over his shoulder, calmly walked over there, calmly planted the gun. So that whole I'm afraid for my life, that's just an excuse to use to justify harming us. They're not afraid of no BGF, no Bloods, no Crips, and nobody because they have all the weaponry and they have all the military backing. So I don't trust the white supremacists when they say that. Now, they'll say that to you because they're probably trying to hit it. You're, you're an attractive sister, so those white guys, they campaign for you very heavy. So I know the deal. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. But, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. But my thing, I, I, I wonder why don't you call out white supremacy more? I guess because in my in my sense, I don't see it the way you see it. You know what I mean? When I'm, and that's why I brought up the Capitol. When I'm down there, these white guys are playing the game against each other. It's all about playing the game. And there is just, for some reason, we want to just, you know, put a Band-Aid on and say, oh, we're a victim. It's white supremacy. Oh, they're holding back. But meanwhile, we could just play the game and be on top. Put ourselves in those positions where we are on top. But nobody wants to play the game. But see, now we're talking in codes, Kim. See, we, we, those are vague codes. See, when you say they play the game, what these dudes do, these white supremacists, they will compete with each other to see who's going to control the black population. It's like two plantation owners fighting. You know, they're fighting over each other, but you're going to somebody's plantation at the end of the day. So, well, we no, got, but if we stepped up and stepped outside of that so called plantation, we can play the game and we can do it, but there's a lot of people that don't want to take that step. Because we, you people know, there's don't a lot like... of people that says, "Well, this is who I am, or this is how I'm gonna." You know, when I go and mentor some of these girls, you know, I talk to them and they say, "Well, I don't care if no one likes me; they don't have to like me." And I say, "You know what? Let me know how that works out for you. Let me know how far you're gonna get in life." I'm just saying, I don't care if they don't like how I'm, I'm dressed. I don't care if my hair is... Now, good. why do you think they well, have like that? Yeah. Okay. okay, let's go back. Okay, no, so why do you think those girls have that that I don't care mentality? Well, and not just those girls. A lot of black youths, they have this mm-hmm. I don't care mentality. Why do you think that is? Because they are a product of their environment. Right. They are coming from that generation above where these kids are now, which is probably my generation, Right. That generation above, you have, unfortunately, you had kids having kids. Mm. And this is, I can't speak in every city. I can just say from Baltimore City, from what I've learned here. You have kids having kids because they knew they were going to get more assistance if they had kids even while ha- being a kid, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So you had young girls, right? So the last, think about most of these kids that I deal with, they're living with grandma, right? And these are the ones that are, used, that are still in a home. We have a lot of homeless kids here, too. But they're living with grandma because grandma is really the last one in the household to hold it down. 
right? You got that generation in between now when they drop out of school at eighth grade or, you know, whatever grade because they were having kids. Which they can't help. Okay. I mean, we all know you had to go to work and have a baby. I got, I got, I already know where you're going. So this is the thing I have with that because that's what the white supremacists okay. they like to point out the black folks who have all the kids and all the single mothers. The, they're the issue. They come from an environment of these single mothers that don't know how to raise their kids, and that's why they get but targeted. That's all colors. Hispanic, white, but, everybody. Yeah, but Hispanic and white people are not getting shot down in the streets like black people. It, we, we get treated very uniquely. The Hispanic and white people didn't get Jim Crowed, and they're not being funneled into the prison system just like black people. So our situation is more unique, and it has nothing to do with people um, having a bunch of babies because Trayvon Martin's mother didn't have a bunch of babies, and he got shot, and the white supremacists... Are, you're, you're, you're talking about specific cases. I'm talking about... What's more? Uh, let's go down the list. Story? Look at Mike Brown. Mike Brown, mama didn't have a whole bunch of kids and all this, and he got shot. Another specific instance. So I'm looking at the Jordan majority. Russell Davis. The I mean, kids I, that I have in my classes, that is the issue. Right. The majority of the kids. Most of the girls that I have, they are the first generation high school. They're, they're going to be high school graduates, first generation. Well, the thing, and also let's look at this. Why? In the 1960s, because that only started in the 1960s where you had women who would have a number of children out of wedlock. Well, no, let me let me let me mm-hmm. let me preface that it was okay. reintroduced back into the 1960s. Let me say it like that. That was reintroduced back in the 1960s because. Between 1865 and 1965, that 100 year period, we didn't do that. Now, what happened before 1865 and what happened after 1965? Before 1865, black people were bred on plantations. That was our purpose, especially the women. The white supremacists orchestrated breeding farms where they would make black women have a number of kids by a number of people so they could put their children on plantations to work and profit from that. That was something that was 100% orchestrated by the white supremacists. Now, and I don't disagree with that. Right. I agree. Exactly. So what happened, we were forced after the um, uh, antebellum slavery was over because then we had a new form of slavery called the Black Codes and Jim Crow, which was still slavery. Um, But we were forced to live in communities where we had no choice but to be self-sufficient because we were under the constant threat of attack because we would be lynched at any given moment. But in 1965, the white supremacists saw that black people were fighting um, that system of Jim Crow. So they threw out a uh, a token bone by offering certain welfare and, and government assistance benefits that were at first unique to white white people in society because welfare was created for white women because people try to make welfare a black thing but welfare was created for white women and they weren't being funneled into the prison system but when black people when welfare came that gave us that plantation mentality again because what happened the white supremacists would go up in black people's homes and say okay I'll give you this but you can't have a man here And that introduced that plantation mentality again because that broke up the families like they did on the plantation. And that was orchestrated by the white supremacists. Now what the white supremacists will do, they try to make it a Democrat-Republican thing. You you understand? And that's the thing I don't fall for because all of them work together. They're all complicit with the whole system. Is, Is that correct or incorrect? I would say I agree with the first half of that. I think that was the plantation mentality. Right? Obviously, obviously, they were trying to have do more babies. They could have more slaves and more trade and make more money, obviously. But at some point, we did get on our feet. And then at some point, we decided, not just blacks, but at some point, you know, that mentality came where it was like, well, I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to accept what is given to me. Not thinking about, you know, the repercussions of it, which is how it would affect generations to come. But but again, I blame the white supremacists because black people almost didn't have a choice to a certain degree. Because black people, when there was the great migration after World War II, and this is the thing that the white supremacists like leaving out. Um, after World War II, they started giving all of those home loans and those government VA back loans to white people exclusively. Black people were shut out of that home ownership um, bubble boom that happened right after World War II. 
and giving those home loans and those, those FHA loans, that created the modern white middle class. Because white people at the time, in the 1930s and 1920s, they were just as broke as black people. But when World War II was over and they gave white people all of these resources, that's when the white flight happened. People talk about white flight, but they don't talk about how it was government backed. And white people were allowed, I use the word allowed, to move into the suburbs. And black people, even if they had money, were not allowed to move into these suburbs. And they had it in the documents. They would have it in the leasing agreements that black people were not allowed to live there. So black people, orchestrated by the white supremacists, were funneled into um, less than stellar neighborhoods. And we were not allowed to have certain jobs because of the white supremacists who had the white owned unions that they still have today. And basically they said, okay, look, we've created this situation over here. So we'll give you another option based on the situation we've created. We'll give the, you, you will give you welfare, but the woman can't live in the house. So we, what, what did we really have too many choices though? Uh, I'll agree with you again in the first half. I do agree in 19 points started to happen. That makes me, that reminds me of Black Wall Street, which I know you're probably familiar with. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously that happened. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we have to take accountability and responsibility for our actions. At some point we mm. have to say, look, this happened. It sucks. But what are we going to do about it? You know what I mean? So we can't just keep laying down and saying, oh, well, the white supremacy is to blame. Like, we can't just keep laying down. We're at the point where the Hispanic community is now doing better than we are at some, in some areas. And they're allowed right? by the white supremacists. The white supremacists allow them to do that. They allow them and they allow the Asians. They allow them. The key word is allow. It's not like these groups are just coming over here on their own just taking over. They are allowed to do certain things because the white supremacists is orchestrated. So a lot of black people who are conservative, they say, well, I know it's bad, but we need to take responsibility. Well, the first rule of responsibility is to acknowledge uh -huh. the white supremacists orchestrating this stuff, correct? Well, once you acknowledge it, but then what? what, what acknowledge the, the, the problem is with nobody's, you're not even acknowledging it, Kim. You, you won't even, you know, every time I bring up white supremacy, you say, yeah, it's bad, but you, you understand? So, well, no, yes, you're absolutely right. There are some cases where I can see your point. I, I, I'm agreeing with you right now. Sir. There are some points that I can see your point, right? But there are some points I can't see your point. You know what I mean? Name, so okay, that, okay, that's okay, where I go. But, okay, you know, okay, I okay Kim, let me ask you the Kim. Name any yes. form of people activity where there is not white supremacy involved in this country. Name anything in labor, law, sex, war, education, Anything in this country that does not have white supremacy involved? Name anything. Now this is this is a great mind trick, a great play by you to say, because this is not something that I look into and that I study. But I would actually have to take a look at some situations. Well, I'm just going and, by you know. I'm just going by you. down for you, right? But, but that I'm, was great. I like that move, Tariq. I mean, this is like playing chess <laughs> on the phone, and you're good. You're good. I just, you know, this is something that I study and I look into. Yes, indeed. And I'm, I'm a common sense type of person, Kim, you know, because I listen when people mm -hmm. tell me, like you just said, well, I agree about white supremacy here, but not all the time. Oh, OK, well, tell me where there's not white supremacy. And that's that nobody can really ever point that out. You understand? Well, do you give people a chance to be say, OK, I'm going to ask you this question. You do. You do the research and then let me know. Do I want you to I want you to do the research. I do. And I, I'll give you, and I, you well, know, I, you find, I, yeah, when you find I, it, yeah. you, you hit me on Twitter and say, hey, Tariq, I found something where there is not no white supremacy <laughs> involved. It, it, it's going to take a minute, but I, I want you to do that. But as we know. I, I accept the challenge. I definitely accept. Yes, indeed. But but white supremacy is involved in, in, in everything we do. So it's like the elephant in the room that we keep trying to go around. And. I'm like, okay, let me see what, let me focus on this elephant, because that's why I always bring up white supremacy. When people are talking about black on black crime and the Democrats and the Republicans and abortion and crack and hip hop, I'm over here looking at the white supremacist sitting in the corner, kind of twiddling his thumbs because I know that he's behind all of it. And that's what I, <laughs> I, I, I want to acknowledge him. 
Okay. Well, I accept the challenge. I'm going to take a look into it, and I'm going to come back with them. Um, you know, I might surprise you. Yeah, that's that's cool in the game. I, I mean, you know, I'm going to do the research. Yes, indeed. I definitely. Am. Now let's talk. I want to talk about your your situation. Now you're married to a white guy. Okay. Now, and, I, and I've seen some of your pictures, and one thing I noticed that you know, there's a lot of white males. You're around a lot of white males. How do white women react to you? Because I know historically white women do not like black women who are with their men. White women, they say that black women don't like that when, when a white woman gets black men, but white women despise when a black woman. And I think it's true probably on both sides. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, it's true on both sides, but I know for a fact white women really don't play that shit. So how do they react to you? I don't know. You know, I think if you say that, I'll, I'll say I don't know. I've never, I've never asked anyone, but they might maybe play their hand a bit better and they don't show it. Mm. I don't know because I've never actually encountered that. Oh, okay. Um, now, I have encountered, I'll tell you this, Tariq, I have encountered where black men actually get angry with me and say things to me when I'm with my white husband. Mm. They actually verbally say things. Like, what do they say? Like, come back to us. That's, that's a popular one. Mm. Come back to us. Or what? Are we not good enough? I mean, this could literally be walking down Baltimore in a harbor. Mm. And they will say things. And now I'll ask you, why do you suppose these guys say these types of things? Because those, those are dusty niggas. Them niggas are dusty. <laughs> and it, 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 they don't represent... <laughs> That's dusty nigga talk. You, you know what I'm saying? And that's a pro I have a problem with dusty ass dudes sitting up trying to campaign. If I see somebody with a, <laughs> anybody, that's them. That's their relationship. You know, those are dudes who are just mad because they ain't in no relationship. Period. So just like women, if there's a, if there's sisters out here mad at like a brother who has a white girl, a lot of times it's just they get on this pseudo fake conscious shit. It has nothing to do with consciousness. They just kind of low key hating and and just being dusty. But the thing is, with white women, it's another thing. They don't like, it's that, you remember when um, some black lady called up, I think she called up Dr. Laura. She called up Dr. Laura talking mm -hmm. about her relationship, how her um, husband's friend says a lot of real slick stuff, and Dr. Laura went off on her. That's how a lot of the white supremacist females feel about black women with their, their males. It's just like that, that scene from 12 Years a Slave with Patsy and the white lady beating up on her. You dig? They can't physically beat up on you like they used to, but they do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. I'm pretty sure you're aware of it. You probably just don't want to say nothing. And you No, know, I'm I, not aware. I, I just had a fundraiser on Sunday, and, and there were a lot of white women um, that actually donated to the, to the cause. So mm. I'm not aware of it. I'm not aware of it. Now, how does your husband's family treat you? Uh, fine. You have to understand my husband is almost 20 years older than I am. Mm -hmm. um, his parents are 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 very old. Okay, um, so are, they, are they from Italy? Are they from Italy or something like that? Uh, yeah, his mother is from Tyrol, Tyrol, which so she speaks Tyrolian, but uh, right there on Italy, I guess, kind of up there near Germany as well. And then his dad uh, is first generation Ukrainian, so oh. his parents are from the Ukraine. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think too, you know, I hear stories that, that they tell. When they moved to America, you know, I guess they, you know, was basically coming over on the boat, you know, um, and maybe they kind of felt some of what you guys explain as, as white supremacy, um, but they're but they are white, so I don't I don't that's why I can't really understand where you're coming from with all this. Um, I don't see it like you do, but his family. Well, hold on, hold on, so, let me elaborate on that. You don't know. You say they his family came over. And right, and they didn't have any education. They were on farms trying to, you know, scrape up pennies. You know what I mean? Mm hmm So uh, his family, are they, they, they live here now, right? Yes, yep. Okay. Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, in Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, his family, they were allowed into whiteness. So, yeah, so <laughs> it's a whole different thing. They were allowed into whiteness. And so uh, don't... I know they probably run that whole, well, my family came over, they struggled just like the blacks, that whole BS story. But the thing is... They, <laughs> well, they don't say that. <laughs> no, they don't say that. But, I mean, but, but, but that's what you alluded to. That's what, he what? We were dealt with worse hand. That's obvious. 
I mean, that's obvious. I don't I think we weren't dealt a worse hand. We got we we got under the thumb of white supremacy. See, we keep. I don't like using those vague terms. I don't do. We just got bad luck, and we got a bad hand. No, we got white supremacists orchestrating everything that's happening negative in our society. It's the white supremacists. Okay. It's, it's not Sorry, a bad I, hand. I will say it your way. The white people treat us like garbage, and this is the outcome. But at some point, in my opinion, we could have done better. How? How so? No, I, as my point earlier, it's the, the, no one wants to, not no one, I'd say there's, there are lots of people that do not want to work hard and to do better with themselves and their children. And to, you know, everyone wants to play the victim, there's, not just black no. people. White people no, too. No, 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 no. We're talking about black people, ma'am. So I'm not trying to blur the lines. You say that we could have gotten okay. out of it. I'm trying to see how were we going to thrive in this system of white supremacy where you have the people who are in charge orchestrating all of these things that keeps them in power and keeps us below them racially. What could we have done and that we didn't do because all of us are not on welfare. That's the there's a lot of black people who are not on welfare. The majority of us are not on welfare, right. but we still have to deal right. with white supremacy. I don't see your point on it. I don't. My, I mean, my, my I, point. Like I, I, I said, I'm just asking. I'm trying to get you to elaborate. I'm, I was just trying to get you to elaborate on what we could do to basically protect ourselves from the system of white supremacy. Because that's what we have to do now. Number the, one, in my opinion, number one, stop trying to play the victim. But we so are. Us, I, I'm a victim. I am a victim. Oh, I'm so victimized. That's like but me I going am. out and I'm out there doing my teachings and mentoring and I start crying. Like, what? I am a victim. No, you got to be strong. I mean, this is, come on. Ma'am. We are victims of white supremacy because white supremacy is a victimizer. Basically, you're just saying, hey, just ignore the rapist over there with his dick out. Just go. He, he no, has, that's, not that's all what you're I'm saying. saying. If, you, if that, you sit there and you just let that stagnate you, then you're not going to get any further. That's what I'm saying. Ma'am, that's and like. I'm not look, saying ignore it. I'm that, saying if you, if you acknowledge it, acknowledge it. That's great. Right. But you need to move past it and become on top. How do we you can't move? just sit there and be like, Oh my God, that white supremacist is in the corner. It's scaring me. No, 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 no. But we're victims we of that. We are stronger than that. We are better than that. We're, but we're still victims of that. That's why they can they can do whatever they want to do to us, and we can't do a damn thing about it. That's where we are. We can play this game all day, but at the end of the day, the people who decide to be or choose to be, because all white people are not white supremacists, they can do whatever they want to do to black people, and we can't do anything about it. That's the reality in 2015. That's been the reality since 1492 when they came up out of Europe to explore the new world. So now, how do we deal with that? By just ignoring it and just keep falling into the traps? Or do we look at the white supremacists and say, hey, these people are the problem, how do we protect ourselves while we empower ourselves? I think the way, and I, this is what I see on your Twitter, I'm not, I don't follow you anywhere else, but I can only voice what I see on your Twitter. Yeah. The way that some of your followers are taking this is that everybody white is a white supremacist. Okay, let's deal with me. I, like ma'am, me. I, I got It's a coon or a big I, I have 124,000 followers. I don't know everything that they... Um, this is why you and I are talking, so I can't speak for them. I can't answer right. questions for them. That's why I'm posing. I can just tell you, the followers that you have that have said things to me, that is what I got. I got white ass liquor. I got I, leg friends. I'm not I got doing cool. Um, is, is, but this, that's what the, but this that's is what the, me and you talking. They take your words to reach because you're a leader. You see what I'm saying? You're a leader. So they take your words I'm and not, they're, they're not, taking that in. I'm not a leader in the system of white supremacy. I'm just a, a general trying to maneuver in this system. Now, I can't be a leader. In the, just like our brother Neely Fuller said, we can't. there's no black leaders in the system of white supremacy where they can come and destroy all the so-called black leaders. So th this, I, I acknowledge that I am a victim of white supremacy. I don't get into that ego thing. And, every, and I'm pr fairly successful by many people's terms. And mm -hmm. that doesn't stop me from saying, hey, there's a group of people here 
that will sabotage what I do if I don't really keep my eye on them. Well, look at Bill Cosby, for example. You know, Bill Cosby, he, he was on that, well, we got to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we got to stop getting on the welfare. He was, one of, he was saying the same thing you were saying, damn near verbatim, and they turned on him. They, they flipped their white supremacist system on him to get the resources that he he's accumulated over the years. So the system of white supremacy is not a joke. I don't take my eye off of it. Okay. Well, Bill Cosby, obviously, that we don't, I mean, I'm not saying that all those girls are telling the truth, but something happened. You know what I mean? And wait, what happened? He was having sex with a whole bunch of white women and not breaking them off. And then the white women sounds like they just used that age old, the black man rape me lie that they've always told on black men ever since the 1800s. And they saw a way to try to get some cash out of it now because they're going to try to file all types of civil suits and all that. So I look at it as a cash grab. I don't believe that white women in America waited no 40 years to tell them the brother who raped them. I just, I, I simply don't believe that. That makes no sense. Yeah, there's, I'm sure there's cases where it happened to white male figures as well. I haven't not seen. Just, I, I've, I've not seen it. one case. I've, I've not seen one case. Please point out a case where some people came back forty years later talking about some <laughs> white person raped them. And as a matter of fact, I say since people are talking about because I know the New Yorker they just put out uh, the magazine cover with a bunch of white women, like thirty five white women on there talking about Bill Cosby raped them. I say if we're going to start talking about rape going back to the 60s and all that stuff, let's talk about all of it. Let's talk about all these black women who were gang raped by white men up until the 1960s. And they knew that these black women were raped and they still didn't prosecute the white males. Let's go back and open up the books for all of it. Not just Cosby. There's sisters out here now that's 90 and 80 some years old still alive who were gang raped back in the 60s and the 50s. Let's open up all those books. Even Rosa Parks talked about how a white man almost sexually assaulted her. That was a common thing back in those days, black women getting assaulted by white males they used to work for. So we need to crack open the books and bring all of that shit to the forefront. Do you agree with that? All right, so crack, crack open the books. Who's going to step forward? Oh, there's one sister. We did a story on MelanoiNation.org. There was an elderly black lady. Um, she's down in Alabama. I can't think of her name right now, but she talked about how she was gang raped by some white males and she never got justice. And I think the state of Alabama apologized to her not too long ago. So they need to start breaking bread. So there are people who, who come forward. There's a lot of sisters, but people just don't give a damn when it's a black woman talking about she got raped. So I'm I'm saying well, let's crack open the book. I think with your kind of following and with what you have already together, I think you stood behind something like that that maybe something would happen. Yeah, and that's and the problem is the white supremacists mm -hmm. will usually send their minions to speak up for them, and that's a problem. And this is this is where we get the bedwinch thing from, because a lot of times, black women who have sexual relations with black with white men, they will be out there in the forefront acting as a shield for white supremacy saying well what about black on black crime um well what about black males raping people they become the shield for the white supremacists and this is the problem do, do you do you agree that that's a problem Nope, because I have a white spouse, and I would never do that. But what if, if some a, some if would black argue black woman was raped and gang raped by white guys why would I shield anybody but some would argue, Kim, okay. even the conversation today, you, you, whenever I talk about white supremacy, you go right back to, well, black on black crime and we harm each other and we get on welfare. So some people could interpret what you're I saying. I say all races do that. But, but some white people can interpret. Yeah, I've done some, an article on how whites are more and welfare than we are. That's not, that's not what I'm saying, Terry. But, but some people will interpret. So They could okay. interpret it as bedwinch behavior because you brought up many times black on black crime. What about us not being victims? These sound like white supremacist talking points. If someone interprets that, that I said that way, it's because they're listening to Tariq say that. Mm. You see what I'm saying? These, there's people, I've, I've been having conversations with a guy named Patrick that's one of your followers for, for days now. Okay. Who really is all about you and then what you speak, and he's all behind what you say. And so it's like, and he's actually pretty respectful. I actually like Patrick, I'll say that, because uh, he doesn't say anything crazy. But, you know, there's, there are people like that that really are saying, 
things to me because of how you went at me when I first just said, hey, Tariq, maybe Lafayette doesn't have the resources. And then all of a sudden you posted the picture of me and my husband and then it's like I'm, I'm a white ass. Like, it's like, look, I only have what, 140 characters on Twitter. That's not, that's not what I do. Right. It's not me. I speak for myself. I've always spoke for myself. That is why, you know, I'm, I feel like that attributes to where I am today. You know what I mean? Right. But, but the bottom line, but I, with, with you and your situation, what, in your mm-hmm. opinion, what should we do about white supremacy? What should we do? Because the system of white supremacy shouldn't exist. You say, well, we should stop being victims. But why, why should we live in a society and just be totally okay and not acknowledge a, a demonic system like white supremacy? What should be done about white supremacy? First, I'll say I disagree with calling it white supremacy. Uh-oh. I'll disagree with that. Okay, what's um, the, what is it then? <laughs> I got to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are certain situations out there where, you know, we're at the bottom feeder, but, you know, I, I don't agree with everything that you call. I mean, because according to you, every situation, everything leads to white supremacy. I don't believe that. Okay, and again, tell me what doesn't. And and that is, again, I accept the challenge to do so. So you, you, okay. I, so I you can't even do say what, it, what doesn't lead to white supremacy. So what should we call this system? If it's not white supremacy, you don't know? So you're saying it's a systematic, what do you say it again? Sis, you, you say you don't want to call the system white supremacy, so what is it? If there, it's not white supremacy. If there are certain situations where you feel like you're at the bottom, then stop whining and complaining and get on top. I don't I don't see where somebody's holding me down. The white man isn't holding me down. I don't see that. I don't see that. Okay. Well, that's you. I feel like people have been fighting that for a long time, and it's right. like, um, it's, I'm over it. I'm oh, over it. Okay, so what do you, you and other black people, because the okay. thing is, we get into okay, this. Okay, what we have get, I done? We, no, 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 you say, I don't feel like the white man is holding me down, but mm-hmm. you're in a relationship with a white guy. Correct. And he's not holding me down or holding me back from anything. If anything, he's my number one supporter. Right. And now, and yes, I, I live with him, and I get in the bed with him every night. I would say bed wenching. Is that right? Well, some that people will good. say it's not, you're not being <laughs> held down. Some people will say, well, okay, well, you've surrendered if we you look at it like that. Because it's when not, you say somebody holding me down. My husband is so supportive right. of what I do. It's, un, it's unbelievable. Mm. And he has five beautiful mixed black children. And he does a great job. He's a great father. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. So he had children before you. Yes, it's black women. So, oh, so he has a a chocolate fetish. <laughs> you like black women. Oh, He's not God. holding anybody down. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, hell, Thomas Jefferson had mixed kids, too. He didn't, he didn't <laughs> hold down Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings said the same thing. <laughs> See, the thing is, you think just because you get to live in the big house, I mean, you, get to, you get to house. ride the coach, you I, get to I, travel to Paris. My, I'm not being held down. I make I'm, my own living. I, I make my own. I'm my own person. But, I'm not living in the big house. But you, you that's, that's, you sound, that's, sweet, that's, sweet, that's, sweet, that's, you sound, that's, sweet, that sounds, you sound, that sounds like Sally Hemings. You got a dude with a bunch of black kids running around like Thomas Jefferson, you get to no. you get to live in the big house. What white supremacy? No. I got it made. <laughs> That's what slaves used to say when they would get in the house. But you're no, still you're still under true. a system. You you got to be compliant with that system because if that's you challenge not true. I because love it, his children. That's but not it, true. If if you challenge that system, that's when you'll feel the wrath. That's why you won't even acknowledge white supremacy. What, what? What, what, okay, give me an example. If I challenged it in what way? What well, hell, you, when you see, see, the thing is, a lot of black people think, okay, I'm fucking this white person, so I'm good. Black men and black women get on that thing, just like a lot of black athletes. When they get some money, they like, okay, I'm fucking all these white women, so I'm straight. Bill Cosby thought that. He like, I got my black wife, but I'm banging all these white women. And look what happened. Forty years later, all the white women he slept with is on a magazine about to sue him. 
So don't tell me about white supremacy is not getting at you. They just haven't pulled your card yet. That's the thing. There's no card to pull. There's no card to pull. Oh, man, they will pull your card. They will pull your card when they decide to pull it. See, you, a lot of black people think they can um, coon and bedwinch their way out of white supremacy. And white supremacy will flip on you. And I know a lot That's of... Not true. Uh, you know what, Tariq? I, I invite you to stay with us for a week. Lord, and you can I'm not about to be at nobody's right house now. serving no biscuits. I'm not about to be out there... <laughs> Picking tobacco. I'm not coming. <laughs> I'm not about to be. Y'all ain't about to put me in a 12 years of slave Django episode. I'm cool. I'm, I'm so cool. Man, I'm cool. You got this dude who's out here with a Negro fetish with all these kids. I was in. And, and, and y'all be, and those are some of the biggest white supremacists ever. Those dudes. No, you, do. have to, you have to meet them. You would not even say that, Terry. Okay. That's what I'm saying to you. There, there's, this is not like people believe that this is what's going on because that's what you tell them, that everybody's like this, but that's not true. It's I ain't saying true. he's a bad dude, but hell, just because somebody's having sex with you and they got a bunch of little mixed kids all over the place, that don't make them any less of a white supremacist. That just makes them another slave owner. That's all they are. To, no, it, uh, unless they prove, unless they prove that they're not a white supremacist. And also, and I look at how their woman gets down. Now, you're his main lady. You sound, some of your talking points is that of a white supremacist. So they try to use I'm, the fact that they have sex true. with you. That okay, I'm not a, I'm not racist. My wife is black, and I think all these other black folks need to get off welfare. I mean, so they still have the same racist talking points. They're not giving you any of the power of white society. You, you feel me? If that's if you consider it white society, I guess you would look at it that way. Um, it it is white society. Who's running the society? Name a black person who's running society. Barack Obama is the president. He ain't even running it. Barack Obama bitched out, in my opinion. Yeah, I, well, I won't disagree with that, but um, who's non-white running this society? Can I say Mayor Rollins Blake, who also <laughs> bitched out? Elijah Cummings, what is who she, also what, bitched out. What is she running? They, she ain't She's supposed running. to be running Baltimore City. That's that woman ain't running. She she was out there cooning, doing what she was told. She ain't running nothing. That woman ain't running nothing. So uh, we live in a society that's run by the white supremacists, straight up, and they're not ceding their power to no Negro. Power is something that you have to get on your own, and you have to acknowledge that there are people who will try to sabotage that power. You, that makes sense? Okay. Not, in my opinion, but we'll agree to disagree. Uh, uh, that's a great answer. Great answer. Just <laughs> denial, we'll denial, agree to disagree. denial. I don't denial. see it that way. And, uh, and my thing is this. A lot of times, I don't even get mad at people in interracial relationships. I'm not one of those, you know, I got the dashiki on and all that because, look, we live in a system that's a prison system. It's a prison. And people use what they can to get resources, because black people, we have, and I'm talking about collectively, I'm not talking about on an individual basis, but collectively, resources are um, deprived. We, we're deprived of resources as groups. And we figure we got to do whatever we can to get something from the warden or the guards of this prison. So if either sexual favors, we got to steal some of the resources, we got to beg for some of the resources. So... If you believe that, let me ask you real quick. Go ahead. Sweetie. Why is it that uh, like the Nigerians and all the other Africans come over here and do so well? Oh, great question. Perfect question. Because, number one, they allow very small groups to come over. And before the 1960s, there was a zero immigration pop, uh, uh, policy for African immigrants. They didn't let no African immigrants come over here at all. They didn't let really too many Asians come over here because they, they put Asians in internment camps when things got rough. But after the 60s, that's when they started letting the Koreans and the Vietnamese, a whole bunch of influx of people coming in after the 1960s. And they did that to really um, undercut the black civil rights movement. 
because now when they gave black people so-called civil rights, they let all these other immigrant groups come in under the guise of being minorities. And they took all of the um, jobs that were available to the so-called black population. But Nigerians and these people, they come over because they mm-hmm. come over, they come over in very small numbers and in very controlled numbers. They're told to not interact with black people when they come over here. And they're told this very specifically. Also, if things get too rough for them, they have a home country that will at least give them a refuge. They can go back to a home country and they also have a home language that they can base their culture around which is different from African-American people because we don't have a protection country, a country that will protect us and act as a place of sanctuary. This is why black people basically migrate north and south all the time. There was a great migration to the well, north. I, I know a few Nigerians that do not like American blacks because they claim that we are lazy individuals that haven't taken the opportunity that we have and that we're given. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's something Why that... Why did you say that? Yeah, there's some some of them say that not all of them, because I've been over to Africa several times and this whole thing that Africans don't like us. No, I was welcome with open arms over well, there. I know the Africans. I know it's the, best the, the ones over and here. Now, when they come over here, we, we talked about this in one of my movies, how a lot of Africans, they, they're shown videos and they're told do not interact with black people, because what happens is they don't want a, a pan-African connection. This is something that the white supremacists sabotage with the Marcus Garvey movement. When a brother named Marcus Garvey, I'm sure you're familiar with him, wanted to do a back to Africa movement to link black people up here with African people. Um, the FBI thwarted that. They put agents in that whole situation and they sabotaged the whole thing. In the 1970s, um, the, the, what's his name? Zabrinsky's, the, the big new, I can't pronounce that guy's name. He was one of Nixon's guys. They had something called the white paper where they wanted to sabotage any type of connection with Africans in some of these newly independent African countries. So there's always been this whole saboteur thing with black people linking up with our home country because us linking up with the home country, that will give us a, a certain level of cultural strength that they don't want to have to deal with. We exist in this country for the white supremacists to specifically mistreat and subjugate at will. And I acknowledge that. And I want to know how do we stop being in that system and how do we protect ourselves from that system? So some people say it's a victim thing. Yes, because these people who are white supremacists are victimizing us. They're victimizing you? Or I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you're saying. They're victimizing you currently? Or are they victimized in previously? We are victimized currently, all the time, nonstop, because the system is there. Now, just because some people will treat you nice on a day-to-day basis, see, we get fooled by that. The system should not exist. See, we get tripped out because... On, in, 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 you know, I, we think because some white people are smiling in our faces, everything is okay. We think because we are sucking somebody white or licking somebody white, <laughs> everything is cool. Racism is over. But on a one-on-one basis, you're cool. The white supremacists, they've always accepted black people in small numbers. The problem is when it's a number of us, when it becomes a group, that's when the issue comes in. They ain't going to be so nice. Um, a brother named Claude Anderson said it starts with the group of six. When it gets to around six black people, that's when there's a problem. That's when the police are called. That's when, when black people move into a neighborhood and it's one or two, that's fine. But when it gets to about six, the white people start yanking their children out of school. They start getting up out of there. If there's a restaurant somewhere and there's one or two blacks sitting in there, that's cool. But if there's a group of black people, white people will call the police or just get up and leave. And there's several stories about this. So I always look at how black people are being treated as a group. Me personally, white people treat me great. I, white people are very courteous to me. They treat me because... And do you think that's because you're educated and you carry yourself properly and well? Like you would say that would be saying white, but do you think maybe that could be? Um, no, it, they do it because it's just usually when I go places, a lot of times it's just me. I don't, you know, I hang with my family, but it's not a whole bunch of people. You know, it's like me and my children. 
But oh, okay, Terry. You know you're well educated. You know you dress nicely. You know that you carry yourself well. Yeah, but every day, like I'm but not no, in suits every day. No, I'm not gonna mess with you. <laughs> But I'm not in suits every day. Every day on an everyday basis, I'm pretty casual. I'm not walking around in suits going to Applebee's and all that old shit. You know, I'm just <laughs> dressed casually. But it's just me and not a whole bunch of people all the time. So I'm not a threat as one person at, at all. And I'm not a threat to the social order. The, the white supremacists, they've always accepted token black people. That's not a problem. But when it becomes a number of us, that's when there's a problem. See, that's like with you. I mean, they love having you around. You're their black friend. You know, they bring you around. They'll parade you around. And, you know, they're like, oh, this is Kim. She's so great. And they laugh and joke and talk to you about recipes. And, hey, Kim, how do I make black eyed peas? You know, they talk all that shit. <laughs> but but let, let it be like you and five of your homegirls. Then all of a sudden you're going to become a ghetto hood rat. You know, then it becomes something else. You, you dig? So I, I know how they operate. So I don't get fooled. I guess I'll just disagree because I've never, I've never encountered that. That way, you don't hang with a whole bunch of black people. That's the thing. You go out, start. <laughs> I do hang with black people. No, you don't. I've seen your pictures. Uh, it, it's like <laughs> you don't hang with a whole bunch of black people. No, you don't. You just, I do. Where are they? The only black people you hang with are your husband's kids. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Man. That's not true, but I, that's funny. I grew up in PG County, so that's, that's definitely not true. There you go. There you go. Now, how old are you, by the way, Kim? You, you're late 20s, early 30s? Yes, 33. Oh, okay, okay. So you got you an older white dude. There you go. So I hope he's breaking bread. I mean, don't be in the shit for no reason. I always stay calm. Oh, Lord. Uh, hey, he like, loves me dearly. Okay, that's, that's cool in the game. That's cool, but get some out the game though. Donna, don't be in there just for, for a pat on the head. Just get some out the game, and and try to get some of those resources so you can dwindle them back to the black community. I'm like, look, hustle the game. Don't be up there with the bullshit. No, you do. <laughs> we need we need we need no, some double I agents. Have, I don't have to hustle anybody. We need that's some, why, that's we, why it's hard for me to see your point of view. That's we need why. some double agents. You need to be finding out what these white supremacists are doing <laughs> behind the scenes. You need to be in there looking at blueprints. <laughs> Fuck all that. Get the dick out your mouth and get the blueprints. That's what you do. <laughs> Let us know what he got planned for us. Shit, y'all laying up in the house with these white dudes. Get some out the game and let us know what's up. All right, Ken, it's been real. Let me let you get off here, Ken, but it's been a great talk. It's been good. Yes. yes You're indeed. actually a lot nicer than I thought you would be. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. I appreciate that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And also, and if you decide to come back to the black community, I can hook you up with some brothers <laughs> that's real cool um, who, who can rock Oh, there you go. Come back to us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, when, now if, if he starts calling you nigga in the bedroom, don't say we didn't warn you. Oh, <laughs> He would never do that. Well, don't say he that now. Never. I know how these white dudes are because you real you you on your P's and Q's. Now, when you start saying, yeah. hey, you start challenging white supremacy, and I watch what happened. You go up in that house and that say, hey. That would never, ever happen. Wait. I hope when you come to Baltimore, you look us up. I don't know about that now. I, um, time. I, 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 I'll look for the, the first plantation on the left. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I look for the cotton field <laughs> right off the freeway. <laughs> no, but um, but don't let them call you no names. Don't because I know when they get with these white dudes with these black fetishes, they get in the bedroom and wanting to do. They want to do all types of degrading <laughs> shit to you. Come on, you know you might not admit it now. They be doing all types of degrading stuff to you. Don't let that man tie you up and put you <laughs> on a on on a rope and. And, and oh, make, make you have sex happen. in a tree and don't all this. worry about me don't worry that oh, will yeah. never happen I, yeah. I would yeah. never don't get tree bark burns on your arms he got you hanging in a tree <laughs> hitting it oh yes yeah, i'm gonna Are lynch you come up with this i'm gonna lynch fuck you ken oh lord <laughs> yeah, i don't want to see you in a ghetto gaggers video all right <laughs> kim where, what's your twitter let everybody know where to find you on twitter and uh y'all be nice Sorry. yeah be nice so mean uh at kim Clasic. Kim and Clancy. they can uh, visit my, my website, potential-me.com, and see what we're trying to do in Baltimore. There you go. Cool. All right, Kim. Thank you so much for calling in, sister. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. 
All right, that was the interview with Sister Kim Classic. And that is the end of the Tariq Elite Radio Show. It's been real, fam. Don't forget to check me out at TariqElite.com. Don't forget to check out HiddenColorsFilm.com. The brand new lecture video, the Code of Conduct Tour, that's going to be available possibly next week on Tariq Radio and MacLessons.com. And by the way, go to MacLessons.com to get all the old pay-per-view specials and all that good stuff. And I'm going to holler at you guys this Sunday on Ustream. I'm out. Peace.